And we are live. Aloha. Welcome to another episode of China, Hawaii, and you. I am your host, Andrew Zimmerman, and I'm really excited for our topic today. We're going to be talking about uh, Hong Kong and Minneapolis. That may sound like a familiar city to those of you who are here, because with me is our returning guest, Robbie Duby. He's an attorney uh, that's working out in the area. We're really, really excited to have him back on. Thank you very much for being with us, Robbie. Yeah, happy to be back on. Uh, no Aloha shirt this time. I, as a lawyer, I'm still at work, which happens sometimes, but I'm excited to be back on the show and uh, excited uh, to get going. Yeah, we're, well, don't worry. We're matching on the attire today, okay? So I dropped the Aloha shirt too. We're just going. Well, you're very going Hawaii over. formal. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, 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 keeping the, we're keeping the formal. We're keeping the formal look, okay? I'm not coming in with like a swimsuit. Um, but. <laughs> Um, you know, today's topic is, I think, going to be one of the most interesting things that I've talked about in a really, really long time, which is we're going to be contrasting um, Hong Kong and Minneapolis. Now, the really big significance of these is we, what we're talking about today is the riots that both of these countries experienced in the last two years. Uh, as you know, as everybody uh, may have remembered, in uh, 2019, there were uh, really, really large uh, large scale riots, not just in Minneapolis, but all over the country in the in, in the wake of the George Floyd death. And there were thousands more protests, but we're going to save a lot of time up for to talk about that with Robbie, because Robbie is our certified Minneapolis expert who knows everything about it. <laughs> Oh, um, now, the one thing that I want to sort of say at the outset for how we're going to frame this is, we, and I've discussed this with Robbie ahead of time, is we're going to kind of be uh, breaking this episode into three parts. The first is going to be Robbie's going to talk about Minneapolis and kind of what's happened over there. The second part, I'm going to be talking about Hong Kong and what sort of led to the riots over there. But I'm going to make sure that after I've framed the issue, I'm going to give Robbie a chance to respond to anything that I've said. And so if there's something that we don't agree on in the, in the framing, we can iron it out beforehand. And then for the third part, we're going to sort of contrast a lot of different things across these, namely the causes of the riots, the goals of the riots, um, you know, what are the consequences of it, and we're going to sort of see how the two countries really look broadly at violence, both just randomly and directly towards uh, something like the state. Uh, so without further ado, um, before we get started, Robbie, I understand, and I could be wrong on this, that you are not a massive fan of the Chinese Communist Party. Am I incorrect in that statement? Uh, that's underselling it, probably. I have very little positive to say about that entity. Dang, tough crowd, tough crowd. That's okay. I'm going to tell you out, 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 out at, the, at the very outset that my goal is to, is to sort of change your mind, okay? I don't have high hopes for it, but we'll see where I can get, all right? So okay. without further ado, uh, Robbie, do you want to take us, let, let's, let's, let, I'll let you frame it as kind of openly as you want without me sort of leading you into a question, but can you tell me sort of what happened with these Minneapolis protests and or riots? Now, these are obviously not all protests turned into violence, right? In fact, the vast majority don't. But it seems to me that there's clearly more than one, you know, person dying to the hands of police that led off this massive, massive social unrest. So can you talk a little bit more about what happened? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I do appreciate you pointing out that obviously not all protests are riots and not all riots are protests. The vast majority of what happened around the country with George after George Floyd's death were protests. Um, but there was a bit of Orwellian news uh, articles with mostly peaceful protests, which I think is uh, would be to say not peaceful protests, which would be riots. Um, now, that being said, Minneapolis um, has had um, I think a lot of tension between the African-American community and it, the police department for a long time. Um, all the way back in 1998, the Human Rights Watch uh, reported that the Minneapolis Police Department was committing human rights violations. Um, there has been a string of police chiefs and mayors who have said, we got to reform our police department, we got to change things about how we're doing our police department. Um, and a lot of the reform that's been asked for for a long time has not happened. Uh, a really important thing to Kind of know going into George Floyd is in 2016, Philando Castile was also uh, shot and killed by the cops. Mm 
And that set up a large string of riots where, uh, excuse me, a large string of protests where the police department at the time said, okay, we're gonna change a lot about how we do this. We're gonna change about how we do traffic stops. We're gonna change how we approach uh, minorities who are having interactions with the cops. Well, then you have George Floyd mur murdered in on May 25th, 2020 um, by Derek Chauvin. And it's this horrific video where for nine minutes and 27 seconds, you see this police officer kneel on the back of George Floyd who's screaming, I can't breathe, can't breathe. He's asking you know, the officer to stop and Derek Chauvin doesn't. Now, um, there's a lot of social media hot takes of, well, this wasn't a murder because George Floyd was on these drugs, or this was a murder and Derek Chauvin meant to do it the whole time. A jury has found that Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. And so personally, I don't consider that to be up for debate. I think the court of law has determined that and people's social media takes don't particularly matter. But what this did spark was protests first at the death of George Floyd, but then those did, in my opinion, turn into riots. You had burning, you had hundreds of businesses burned down. You had millions of dollars in property damages. You had um, buildings being burned down as far as the suburbs of Woodbury, uh, which if you're a Minnesota person, you know that's pretty far from the, the core of, of North Minneapolis where this happened. And so I think that you had decades of building tension where police department and mayor said, we're gonna change, we're gonna change, we're gonna change, just give us time, work with us here. Without the change, you had a murder in 2016, you had a murder in 2020 with George Floyd that sparked the protests at the same time that people had been locked in for COVID. And um, I think there was a lot of social unrest with that generally um, that, that spiraled and really resonated with a lot of people. Um, and I, you know, there are so many articles that have been written and research that has been done to show that the Minneapolis Police Department in particular um, has a lot of work to do for actually disciplining its officers and um, actually making sure that it holds officers who violate people's rights or who violate the code of conduct accountable. And I think even the police department themselves and the current chief Arredondo has admitted, we have fallen short and they have fallen short of, of the burden they need to do. So I think to kind of sum it up, you know, people, it, you had some kind of extreme reactions of, oh, you know, all cops are terrible and we got to get rid of them, which I think is, is frankly an absurd position. Um, but then you also had, well, you know, just don't commit crimes and things won't happen to you, uh, which also doesn't take into account the number of incidences with Minneapolis police officers who have violated rights um, or who have broken the code of conduct without having any discipline or any repercussions for it. That's a really, really great summary of um, what's happened in, in Minneapolis. And the, th the three things that I want to ask you to sort of set the framework for how we're going to analyze Minneapolis is what were the perceptions of uh, the reaction with these protests and or riots that broke out at both the local level when it comes to Minneapolis, the national level, and the international level, to the best of your understanding? So... I was still living in Honolulu when um, George Floyd was murdered. Um, and so a lot of my initial experience with it was through friends who were still living there or through the connections I had in different communities, seeing different um, communities burned down that I knew I, I had been there. I had been to those businesses. I had been in those streets. Um, on the local level, there was a lot of pain and a lot of heartbreak um, because it just felt like the city was broken and that people couldn't understand why these things kept happening. There was a lot of anger. I, the experience of people in the city itself versus the suburbs versus the exurbs was all very different. Um, you know, speaking to friends who lived in Minneapolis, it was, why is everyone focusing on, on the riots when all of this has been mostly peaceful and, you know, we need all these reforms and why is no one talking about it? And then you know, talking to friends in the exurbs who said, you know, the city's burning and why is no one doing anything about the city burning? And uh, why, you know, why can't people just stop you know, rioting and I think a lot of disconnect between the two sides there. Um, you know, a lot of the people who didn't live in Minneapolis that I saw on social media were either we got to defund the police and abolish it and um, all cops are horrible or it was, you know, send the military in and crush all of this, uh, which I think is really unhealthy and, and a sign that people had stopped seeing human beings in front of him and had stopped seeing George Floyd as a human being who had died and he was instead of a symbol 
and stopped seeing Derek Chauvin as a man who had committed a crime and instead saw him as symptomatic of all police officers everywhere, which is just not, in my opinion, fair. Um, on the international level, uh, you know, there was a lot of um, outrage in, in, around the world. Um, you know, I think particularly with China, since we'll get to that, I think China really wanted to capitalize on this and use it as a point to divert attention from themselves and divert attention to legitimate critiques of, of their policies in Hong Kong and, uh, and around their the country of how they were treating dissidents. Uh, but even in Europe and, and around the world, uh, a lot of countries were just really appalled at what they were seeing. And um, I, I think in a lot of ways, rightly so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, don't worry. We're going to get to the we're going to get to this, the contrast in a second. Um, but now that you've sort of set up the background for what's happened in uh, in Minneapolis, and I think you did a really, really excellent job. I don't think there's anything. If I can I... pause you for one second, Andrew, just apologize, but I had a timer going for nine minutes and 27 seconds, which just ended. So that entire time we've talked, that's how long uh, Derek Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's. Uh, wow. Wow. Wow, that's a really, I, he, didn't, he didn't tell me this ahead of time, everybody. So I, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, sorry that's, to jump that on you, but I thought no, I'm, I'm really, really it's hard to feel to that you, impact until you really sit there with it. Um, yeah, and, I'm really okay. glad that you did that for us because that, that, gives a, that gives a really good sense of, you know, how terrifying it must have been. Um, so now, but, but now that you've given the contrast, uh, I want to give a, a quick minute to sort of talk about Hong Kong. Uh, a, a lot of what I what I say is um, not going to be something that's particularly like broadcast in Western in like Western media. That's not to say that you won't find it right. For example, there's plenty of things that you'll find and maybe not like CNN or like Fox News. But I did do a really, really thorough job, I think, in kind of making sure that my understanding of how Hong Kong got to a situation was correct. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out my understanding of what brought over the Hong Kong riots, and then I'm going to give you a chance to tell me if there's like a quick point of like factual problems that you have with my framing. Does that sound good? Sure. Sounds great. Cool. All right. So a lot of the problems that we sort of experience with Hong Kong can it kind of is extend all the way back into the early 1800s. Uh, in the early 1800s, the British were trying to figure out how they were going to finance a massive tea empire. At the time, something like 10% of the entire government's funding came out of tea duties or like uh, imports that you would get for tea. It was unbelievably popular, but the problem was the British were not able to find anything that would properly, you know, that the Chinese really wanted, right? And then they found opium. Opium became very, very quickly well known as through China and it was explosively popular. This was despite the fact that opium had been illegal for a very, very long time. Um, but it was one of those things where similar to smoking marijuana in the United States, it is very technically illegal, but you know, according to statistics, right? There's something like 130 million Americans that admit to smoking weed at some point in their life. And we clearly don't have had, we don't have that many people who have gone to jail for it, right? So it was one of those, <laughs> it was one of those kind of softly illegal things, right? And so the British kind of uh, played around with um, keeping, keeping some amount of distance to uh, selling opium in China, but they very much were doing a lot of smuggling operations that are maybe going to like a um, an Indian border, trying to get it, get it sold out through there. Uh, and so a lot of this kind of spiraled when, when the Chinese viceroy, Min, Min Zixu, uh burned about 20,000 crates worth of opium um, publicly. And the British demand reparations for it. Uh, Chinese wouldn't do it. Quickly, a war breaks out and uh, the, the Chinese lost. There's no, there's not really a way to, to get around it. Now, my, I, I am somebody who tries to read things from both sides, but I will admit to you, I have a very difficult time, and I had rather I should say I had a difficult time justifying the British position of selling opium within, within China. I think it was very clearly a move of just economic greed at the expense of really destroying the social fabric of the whole country and sort of bashing over its laws, right? Um, but regardless, 
uh, the war sort of ended after a, a naval blockade that China wouldn't, wasn't really in a position to overcome. And a deal got broken in, which would lease Hong Kong, which was at the time was basically a rock. It was almost completely uninhabited. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not kidding. It was very, very, uh, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was very, very, it was not even close to what it is now, right? And much of that exists because of, you know, British funding and special economic privileges that it got. Um, but anyway, they leased uh, Hong Kong for 99 years. And uh, that lease kind of got bumped to about 140 uh, because the war ended in the war ended in 1800. But then World War II kind of messed with the clock a little bit. But anyway, uh, the Thatcher government ended up ceding Hong Kong in, um, in June of 1997, back to the back to the Chinese. And the the goal the one of the things that was very clear in the um, in the handover right was that there would be a recognition of one country, two systems. In other words, there would be a 50 year point, a 50 year period of special economic and several privileges that were not necessarily extended to mainland Chinese. Uh, now, here's where things get a little bit messy. Uh, in 2018, uh, there was a man, I, I cannot pronounce his name, so I won't try, that, uh, that went down to Taiwan um, when he was with his girlfriend at his time. And he killed his girlfriend in Taiwan and then went, went on a plane back to Hong Kong. He quickly ended up telling the police what happened. But the problem kind of came out that there was no, there was at the time between Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China, there wasn't any kind of established extradition laws. Um, so in other words, if you had some, and what, the, what Beijing kind of realized was that there was a loophole such that if someone was from Hong Kong, and then committed a crime in China and then ran back to Hong Kong, there would be really nothing that they could do. And so uh, what kind of came out of that was a, ex a bill for extradition. There was a bill of extradition, which is very, very simple. Um, you know, we're just gonna have an extradition law that says you, you can get tried in, in Hong Kong. Um, and if you are found guilty, you get sent off to mainland China for, um, you get sent off to mainland China for whoever knows what. And now this is what actually sparks the big protest. What not a lot of people know is that there were two layers of protest between Hong Kong and China, excuse me, between, between Hong Kong and self. The two layers of protest, right, was the, the was, well, the, rather I should, the first one that came out was the immediate response to the extradition law. Now, the funny thing about the extradition law is the extradition law was actually withdrawn um, there was a overwhelming uh, negative. Not withdrawn uh, at first. What's that? Not withdrawn at first. Uh, Not withdrawn at first. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, Land suspended it, and then only after protests withdrew it. Sure. Sure. <laughs> I think, right, it's, I right, think it's important. I'll, okay. Okay. No. 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 I'll I'll, I'll give you that. Um, but the, there was a second wave of protests that came out, right? And basically, the second wave of protests was in response to what was called the national security law, right? Now, the national security law was, I think, where a lot of the more controversial elements came in because uh, the rioting got extremely violent. So we are talking, um, uh, the airport was shut down because there were like bomb threats going off. It was very common to see people just, you know, starting fires in the street and Molotovs and, Eventually, the, the national security law itself was passed, um, and the, ultimately that sort of led to um, a, we'll say, a forced and quiet, um, quieting of the of the riots here. And that's basically my understanding of it. There's there's some stuff that I've left out, um, but that is that is from what I've read so far. Um, do you have any, with with the exception of that one little bit, do you have any issue with how it ended so far? I think in a important aspect to remember is that as part of the two country one system, Hong Kong is supposed to be able to develop its own laws. It has its own separate constitution that enables it to freedom of association and freedom of speech and different things that the Chinese constitution effectively does not, even if it you know, claims to. And a large part of the concern over the national security large and the extradition bill was that it was going to be the beginning of China overriding the two party, uh, two uh, one country, two systems, um, 
agreement and to eventually fully take over Hong Kong. And I, I think without, you have to have that context before, you, you can't just say, oh, it's an extradition bill or it's a security bill. You have to have the context of what Hong Kongers were afraid it represented. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, now, we've, we've only got about 10 minutes left, but I, th yeah. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I still think that we can get, we can, we have time for some interesting questions, right? So the first thing that I kind of want to talk about is, um, at the time of Hong Kong's, uh, at the time of Hong Kong's uh, heat of the riots, right, a lot of the things that were happening seem to me very, very controversial in the sense that people were kind of being apolitical about the situation, and they were just saying it, it doesn't really matter what your political views are, you don't really have the right to start to like burn down a building, right? Um, do you think that this sort of apolitical sense, of, like this apolitical uh, dedication to nonviolence is a big thing that explains opposition to riots in America? I think Americans in general um, do not like the use of political violence or the, especially when it comes to the destruction of property, the loss of human life. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, our country was founded on revolution. It was founded on, you know, using political violence to overthrow the government that existed, um, to overthrow a tyrannical government. Um, you know, we have the right to assemble, we have the right to protest, we have the right to free speech, which has given the American citizens a constitutional, peaceful way of which to, uh, uh, you know, express their anger, express their concerns, express their desire for change. And I think because of that, we've developed a political system that doesn't view rioting and doesn't view violence as a politically legitimate tool. Um, because there are such a myriad number of nonviolent ways to change and to be effective in government that um, the use of violence just isn't justifiable. Um, and I think that uh, that's how Americans very much, most Americans view this. You'll have people on the political fringes, the left and right, who view violence as a political, a valid political tool, but I would say the vast, vast majority of Americans do not. Okay. Yeah, no, one of the things that's really interesting to me is, um, I don't think that this is written explicitly in the Constitution, but I seem to remember um, something something to the effect of, of Jefferson writing that should the people of the United States find themselves in a government that is oppressive, that they have the right of revolution, right? And this concept of a right of revolution is completely alien in uh, many, many parts of the world, not just China, but um, I would say probably well over half the countries on Earth. Um, if not much higher than that. Do you think that, that those sort of attitudes of maintaining this right to revolution explain a lot of Americans' attitude? Because well, I know you were talking about Americans generally do not support political violence, but it seems like there's always this undertone of like, but we could if we wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I think Jefferson's an interesting one. He was very influenced by the French Revolution where they decided to cut everyone's heads off, which is a little bit different than how we did it. and. Um, Certainly no one riots like the French, but I do think that there is a sense in America that, you know, I think you see this a little bit more on the political right than the political left, but there's a sense that we have the right to oppose uh, tyrannical government. And we have the right to oppose a government that goes beyond the boundaries that we've set for it. And I think that, you know, that's part of what the idea behind the Second Amendment was, is, you know, the citizens have the right to bear arms and an armed citizenry is one that the government cannot oppress. So I do think that there is a sense in the American people and a sense in the an American tradition that there is somewhat a right to revolution. I do think that there are limits to that. I think, you know, the Civil War was a very clear limit of, no, you don't get to secede from the country. You don't get to fight over owning one another's property. There, there are limits, but I do think there's an undercurrent of that. And I think it mostly comes in the idea of liberty, right? That Americans feel that you know, liberty is a, is a value worth fighting for, and that gets projected uh, into the international stage too. And I think, especially with Hong Kong, the American responses to the Hong Kong protest um, compared to in riots, compared to the protests and riots here, I think reflect an idea of, it was viewed as Hong Kong was fighting for liberty and fighting for liberty from, you know, the, the Chinese, uh, the communist Chinese uh, government versus riots here, because you have those legitimate political mechanisms for change, were not a valid form of, of fighting uh, and using political violence. Mm. But that answered your question. No, I think it's, it gives me really interesting insight. Um, you know, it's interesting that the Chinese conception of uh, political violence is that you can't do it 
for sure. And the current, uh, you know, power over the of, of over China, the Chinese Communist Party, right? In many ways, views itself as like a large standing extension of the past five thousand years of Chinese civilization, which has always really, really interested me. Now, one of the things that's been interest that's most interesting is I think that these the dynasties, the Ming Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, have historically observed what's called the Mandate of Heaven. And the idea behind the mandate of heaven is basically that should there be a case where the government does fall to like a violent power, it is basically an indication that heaven wanted this state to fall, right? Right. And um, I think that modern China is sort of moving away from those from those terms. In other words, we're, they're trying to get away from a world in which violent revolution is um, is even conceivable as a method of government change, right? Uh, do you think that, that do you think that more countries are going to kind of adopt this attitude of like we sort of want to get to a post-violence form of governance? Yeah, well, I'll say a few things. Um, it is ironic that the Chinese government is not in favor of violent revolutions <laughs> when that is how the Chinese government that currently exists came yeah. into power. Uh, and also not surprising that they especially wouldn't want the term mandate of heaven um, given their their approach to religion but that being said i think a big idea of the end of history that came around in the 90s with the fall of the soviet union is that we were in a post-war society we were in a post-conflict society that everything from here on out was going to be the rise of democracies going to be the rise of free trade and prosperity globally um, and and that's an idea that you know has really stood on. Obviously, no government wants to be overthrown, and I think anyone, it should always be the position of any government that peaceful change is the appropriate way to change. But and it also has to be the case that peaceful change has to be possible. A change there has to be a mechanism for which the citizens of any government can peacefully change the system of their government. Um, so I, I think. No government wants to get violently overthrown. I think you are seeing a large rise in authoritarianism and totalitarianism and surveillance states, which instead of creating the conditions where the citizens don't feel the need to overthrow their government because they have legitimate ways to address change, the governments are instead focused on so completely surveilling and oppressing their people that they cannot overthrow them. Um, and I think it, you know, there's two ways to achieve peaceful governance. One is to oppress your people so much they can't fight back, or one is to create such a peaceful system that there is no need for fighting. And I think a lot of countries, you know, in the 90s end of history, we were going to go on the peaceful system route. But I think a lot of systems now, a lot of countries now are going on the oppressive route of oppress your citizens so much that they, they literally can't fight back against you. Yeah. Well, that's a really, I think we've laid an incredible conversations, uh, incredible conversations foundations, but unfortunately, the time has blown by. Yeah, and I still think, I'm still very pleased with how much with how much we got done. Um, Robbie, I want to thank you very, very much for coming and coming down on and talking to us again. It was really, really interesting getting your perspective. And hopefully this is something that on this show, maybe with uh, maybe with other guests, maybe with you sometime in uh, the late future, because you're quite busy. and I don't want to have you on every week. <laughs> um, but we're very, very glad that you came on. Is there anything you want to uh, tell people about where they can find you or any projects that you're working on or anything like that? Yeah, so uh, like I said last time, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook. Um, you know, you can email me as well. I think something that is particularly interesting to me at this time period is um, the United States government has been very reluctant to actually accept any refugees from Hong Kong right now. They've done a, a big talk about how we got to help Hong Kong fight for democracy and we need to make sure the Chinese government isn't unjustly imprisoning people and stuff. But if you actually look at the numbers of asylum and refugee uh, given to Hong Kong, it's it's pathetically low, in my opinion. And I think that um, the United States has a duty to accept, um, yeah. you know, democracy, no. people who fight for democracy. So. Uh, if I can pitch anything, it would be to call your representatives, call your senators, and ask them to fight for um, for freedom fighters from Hong Kong, uh, not freedom fighters, but democ people fighting for democracy to get asylum and refugee status in America. I agree. Look, if someone doesn't want to be in Hong Kong, I want to get them. I want to get them a way out. But I feel that I extend that. I extend that to all immigrants. Okay, I'm very, very pro freedom movement guy. Um, but 
that's a lot of things that we could lay on the table, but we're going to have to end it there. Robbie, thank you very, very much for coming back on, telling us a little bit more and helping us kind of make these comparisons of how the two countries see riots and violence. I really, really liked your perspective. I'm sorry I didn't get to change your mind on the CPC, but maybe that'll come someday. <laughs> well, probably not, but I respect you trying. All right. Thank you very much. Aloha, everybody.